I would like to welcome you all to um, today's talk, tonight, this evening's talk, sorry, um, sponsored again by the Archaeological Institute of America's Iowa Society. Um, so let me get started here with just a little pitch um, for the AIA. Um, again, my name is Deborah Trusty. I am a lecturer at the University of Iowa, um, but also the president of the Iowa Society um, of the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, I am joined today by many of my um, fellow officers and our speakers for today as well. Um, so you'll notice that you are muted. Um, that participants are muted and cannot display their video or um, unmute themselves. If you have any questions for our speakers, please put them into chat. You can either direct message me or you can put them in chat in general, um, and we'll be happy to answer them during the Q&A session at the end of this lecture. Um, but first, let me talk a little bit about the AIA, the Archaeological Institute of America, and how awesome it is. Um, especially since this month, October, is um, Archaeology Month. In particular, this week, we have International Archaeology Day on Saturday, this coming day. So this is a buildup. This is one of the many events that builds up to that. Uh, the Archaeological Institute of America is North America's largest and oldest archaeological organization. Um, we support archaeologists, educators, excavations, publications, and much, 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 much more. Um, I don't know if anyone got it, but yesterday my edition of Archaeology Magazine came. Um, so I'm excited to read about Egypt's last temples. Uh, so as a member, you can get this lovely magazine delivered directly to your home. Um, and there's much, much more that this organization does. It provides um, archaeological sites with funding, but also tour abilities and helps out with excavation and field work opportunities as well. So we encourage you to join the Archaeological Institute of America. If you are a student, a scholar, or just an interested Indiana Jones wannabe kind of person, um, we embrace you all here at the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, in addition to Archaeology Magazine, which I just showed you, um, we also have the American Journal of Archaeology, which um, archaeology, or which a the AIA is a sponsor for. Um, if you would like to support, here is information here. But the best way to support is, of course, to become a member. Um, and so I will later put the membership link in chat. But I forgot to do that right now. Um, but until then, um, you can join. Uh, there is a membership poll. And if the society is one of the top three membership joining, membership that gets new members, um, they're going to give that society $250. So, hey, that's a plug to help out the Iowa Society if you're not a member. Before I get into today's talk, however, I would like to plug or shout out our November 15th talk, which will be by Professor Rachel Myers at, the, at Iowa State University. Um, she'll be talking on female benefactors in the Roman Empire. And again, that's on November 15th at 5.30 um, p.m. here on Zoom yet one more time. Um, hopefully that will be our last Zoom we're hoping to go back into in-person um, presentations and talks and lectures in the spring semester. Keep your fingers crossed um, for that. All right, as usual, I would like to alert you all of our code of conduct. Please no harassing, intimidating, verbal, physical, visual conduct that is inappropriate, graphic, or profane. We're all adults here, but, and you are muted in any way. So the only thing that you could do is enchant, but we do reserve the right to remove you from uh, the meeting. Additionally, this lecture is being recorded and will be available um, on YouTube uh, relatively soon. Um, but it is a live presentation and it is being recorded, so we ask that you not record for that reason. Thank you all for your cooperation. And so now let me turn to introductions. Um, 
tonight's talk is being um, led by two fabulous speakers. Erin Daly, who is uh, a PhD candidate at the University of Iowa, who's writing her dissertation on the art styles of Gustave Moreau. Uh, she focuses primarily on 18th and 19th century European art with interests um, in Egyptian, or sorry, in, in Greek and Roman art. She's already completed two MAs, one in art history at the University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame sorry, and the other in uh, 2017 in at the University of Chicago in classics. So fabulous achievements already. Prior to that time, she completed her bachelor's degree at Cornell College, uh, majoring in art history and classics and wrote her honors thesis on Rubens, uh, Head of Medusa. Her research focuses on reception studies as particularly how Moreau received reformulated, conveyed, and constructed knowledge about the early modern and ancient past in his paintings and drawings. Erin is interested in exploring this work against the backdrops of excavations, collections, and displays of Greek, ancient Greek and Near Eastern objects in Paris during the time of the late 19th century. Erin's won multiple fellowships for uh, summer travel for, and study from all of the universities she's attended and has presented at numerous conferences, both in the United States and in France. And the co-presenter uh, for tonight is Bjorn and Dr. Bjorn Anderson. Dr. Anderson is an associate professor of art history at the University of Iowa, arriving here in 2012. He received his bachelor's degree from uh, humanities, in humanities from the University of Oregon, an MA in classical archaeology from University of British Columbia, and an MA and PhD in classical art and archaeology from the University of Michigan. His dissertation focused on the cultural identity of the Nabataean uh, capital of Petra in South Jordan, and his book manuscript is entitled Negotiating Identity in Nabataean Arabia. He serves on the Board of Trustees for the American Center of Research in Amman, Jordan, and is the secretary of our very own Iowa Society of the Archaeological Institute of America, serving in the past as vice president as well. As a trained archaeologist, Bjorn has excavated in both Israel, Jordan, and is currently using photogrammetry and 3D modeling to reconstruct a tomb facade in Petra, Jordan. So tonight, the two of them will be presenting um, a fascinating subject that involves the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, the US Homeland Security, and the Manhattan District uh, Attorney's Office. This talk is titled, The Hoover Fakes, How Defrauding a Presidential Library Exposed the Brazen Sale of Forged Antiquities. And with that, I will turn it over to Bjorn. There we go, I've unmuted. And uh, thank you, Deb, for that introduction. And um, <clears throat> Aaron and I would like today to just kind of walk you through what happened um, a couple of years ago and, and uh, trace that. Before I do, I just want to uh, acknowledge that uh, there's a lot of uh, names I see in here that really warm my heart. I'd like to uh, thank colleagues, uh, new and old, um, students, former and current. Um, my dissertation advisor, Margaret Root, is here. My mom is even here. So uh, yeah, thanks to, to all who uh, have come out for this. <clears throat> um, and before Aaron and I begin, I want to just make a couple of disclaimer notes. Number one, um, neither of us are members of law enforcement. We're not members of the press. We're not lawyers. We're not jurists. Uh, I have shared information with law enforcement. Uh, Aaron has not. Um, but we are not speaking here about the current state of affairs, the current case. Uh, we will be speaking only about what we observe firsthand. Um, this is an active criminal case. The defendant has been indicted, but not convicted, right? Crimes are alleged and we don't want to make any claims to the guilt or innocence of Mr. Sadiq. 
Um, so for this reason, we'll focus on what happened here. We're going to avoid speculation about what happened um, in New York. Owing to um, the broad press coverage, both in 2019 and especially this summer, uh, you know, the broad story is already in the public domain now. So mostly what Aaron and I hope to do is um, share some photos and kind of the inside story of, of what happened um, at the Hoover Presidential Library. And one other note is that the way we've kind of set this up is that I will talk kind of first and last, and Aaron will occupy the center. Um, and that's mostly, again, because we'll talk about the things that we were most involved in. So uh, Aaron uh, focused on um, kind of researching and figuring out, really, uh, the, the seals and, and the issue with authenticity with them and, and found where they were coming from. Um, a lot of my work uh, in that I'll talk about first was kind of how this came to be setting up uh, the visit to the museum and, and things like that. <clears throat> so on screen, you should be seeing an image of the uh, Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. And uh, this is just a few miles outside of Iowa City in West Branch, Iowa. Um, and in uh, 2019, there was an exhibit that was slated to open on April 13th. And here's the press release of April 18th, which notes that it was canceled. And the press release notes, in the course of preparing the exhibits, questions were raised about the authenticity of some of the items that were loaned to the library and museum by the Origins Institute Museum. Due to these questions, we believe the responsible step was to cancel the exhibition. And I would commend the Hoover for doing the right thing and acting quickly and decisively um, once this was, uh, once this all came out in the open. Um, and then you can just see, this was the um, West Branch Times, uh, and that was the first kind of big media coverage. This is an article cited in the New York Times article um, that came out this August. Um, and this was where the gallery owner in New York City, which we had identified as the source of the material that was uh, loaned to the Hoover, uh, the, the shop was raided uh, and the indictments um, <clears throat> came through. This was uh, the New York Times on August 25th, 2021. And here's one of the photos published uh, by the New York Times. Okay, so Briefly here, I thought I'd run you through just kind of through the timeline of how, how this all went as far as I know it. And the, there are some chunks I don't know, so uh, I'll, I'll identify that too. But in May of 2018, the curator of the um, Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum uh, sent me an email and just let me know that they had um, arranged a loan of this um, show about the ancient world. And the reason the Hoover was um, loaning this was that Herbert Hoover and his wife had spent time in the Middle East and he had done some translating of, um, of some Latin sources and things like this. Um, and they'd spent time in Egypt as well. And so they thought this was appropriate for, you know, the Hoover um, Library's mission. And they thought that it would be a nice way to, to attract um, uh, interest uh, from the community and, and further abroad. So he just sent me an email and let me know it was going to open. And this might be of interest to you or your students. And then in September, he emailed again and inquired about the possibility of giving a, a little lecture at a small conference, three or four speakers. Um, I responded that I'd be interested. And I also gave him the name of Aaron Daly um, as somebody who would be an excellent candidate to also give a talk. And then in March of 2019, the director of the museum, uh, Tom Schwartz, sent a nice email to uh, uh, the two of us uh, and invited us and we set up how, when and where the lectures would be given and, and kind of formalized everything. And then what happened was I realized that the photos that had been provided were, were not very good quality. This is the, the catalog I'll show you in a moment. And so I asked the curator if we could come in and take photos of the objects before they were installed in the cases. 
And they said, sure. And we went out um, and my son, Lars, who was uh, 14, he's, he's sitting off to the side here listening. Uh, he came with us as uh, he is the photographer's assistant. Um, we photographed the objects. We, we looked at them and we began discussions um, about authenticity. Um, and we, as Aaron will, will describe, you know, talk to the curator about, you know, do you have any information about the provenance of these objects, things like that. And then uh, discussed a little bit more uh, on the drive home. And then at 10.38 p.m., Aaron sent me an email and um, it was pretty eye-opening. Uh, I found out where I think these seal impressions um, came from. So I'll let her tell that part of the story. Uh, anyway, all of a sudden, things got very uh, compressed because this is April 8th, five days before the exhibit was going to open. So basically, I, the, the, the concern I, I immediately had was how much is problematic, right? Is it just these seals or is it more? And so I spent the next day and a half or so going through every object in the catalog, basically just looking it up on the website and seeing if, you know, how, how bad was it? And it was bad. Um, most everything from the uh, exhibition could be found uh, for sale there, you know, duplicates, whatever. So I then sent an email to the director. Um, actually, well, I, I sent a formal letter via email to the director and uh, it noted in the email to him, I said, you know, look, that most if not all these objects uh, can be documented as fakes. So this is three days now before the museum uh, was supposed to open the exhibit. Um, and I felt really bad sending this, as you can imagine. Uh, they, uh, oh yes, and then I also notified the FBI. I felt obligated to do that. Um, and they acted very quickly and decisively. They did not open the exhibit. Um, and then a few days later, they put out this press release saying, uh, as we saw, um, we can't open the exhibit, right? We're, we're going to cancel it. And then the last couple of things I'll show you in the timeline. Um, oh, let me just go to the next slide here. Would be two years later. And so what happened between there, I don't really know. What I do know is that in May, I was contacted by uh, the New York County District Attorney's Office Antiquities Trafficking Unit and had a, had a Zoom interview with them and just went through the things that I had uh, shared with the museum and then with the FBI. And then in August, uh, there was an email from the New York Times asking if I wanted to comment on you know the story coming tomorrow, which um, documented the um, the raid and the arrest uh, and, and indictment of uh, Mr. Sadiq. So that's the extent of my involvement and in everything later on, which is why, again, we're not going to talk about that. We, we would only be speculating. But what happened at the Hoover is, is I think, pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> Aaron, I've been talking a lot. I don't know if you want to add anything or not. Um, it's fine if not. <laughs> All good, no. Okay, tell me if I'm, if I'm um, <clears throat> misrepresenting anything. Yeah, so here's the catalog uh, that was sent to the museum in a, a PDF, and, and um, it was put together by something called the Origins Institute Museum in El Paso, Texas. And he had a few other, uh, this is an individual uh, who had a few other kind of small exhibits that, that he loaned, um, replicas from the tomb of Tutankhamun, and things like that. Um, and this catalog became kind of one of the keys to our, um, our investigation into what was going on with, with these objects at the Hoover. Um, I think it was 120 objects, uh, plus or minus a few. And each of them had a catalog entry and a photograph, of course. And then what Aaron and I and my son Lars had done is we went out and photographed all the objects uh, up close and, and had great detail work um, of them. 
And I think that really was helpful in kind of figuring out what was going on because we had a lot to work with, a lot of data. Um, <clears throat> so we went out to the Hoover, uh, we looked at the objects, and I will say from my perspective, I remember seeing things like this. Uh, so this is a um, something they call a, a standard, some kind of attachment for a pole, I guess, um, or a finial. And I have taught uh, Near Eastern art um, plenty of times, and, and I recognize this. It's, it's uh, the type of um, bronze that would have been made in Iran uh, at, at the area of Luristan. And, and here are other examples. So this is from the Louvre. And you can see this is very much nicer one um, here. But my first thought was, oh, wow, they got one of the Luristan bronzes. How cool, right? Like, and it was a very eclectic collection of, of uh, objects, for sure. Like, why a Luristan bronze finial and then um, <clears throat> a mace head from ancient Egypt, you know, things like that. But, oh, oh that's neat. They have a Luristan bronze. And, and I do want to just show you, you know, this is a really nice example from the Louvre. But the Louvre also has some kind of, well, the preservation is less... Um, <clears throat> They're not in as good shape. And so to me, that might say, okay, so this is maybe one of the lesser quality ones. And this guy running this you know, little museum managed to purchase one or loan one, great. And note also that there are 31 of these so-called um, masters of beasts type in the Louvre collection. And they're all a little bit different and that's as it should be. And then also I would just show you, here's one from the British Museum um, and uh, there's two points I want to make. One is the provenance on these is generally pretty spotty too, right? They don't know where they came from. So the note on the British Museum's entry for this says, among the earliest lurus and bronzes to enter the museum, how and where Lynch acquired them is uncertain. Possibly he bought them in Baghdad. Uh, this is the ongoing you know, problem of, of authenticity and provenance with antiquities. Also, um, I thought that it was worth pointing out that this um, figure grappling with a pair of stylized lines in typical Luristan style, right? So that's, it's not that it's a mirror image of one particular one. I wouldn't expect that, but is, could it be in that same style? Well, you know, okay, maybe. And there were some axes, uh, there was an ax head, sorry, that's also pretty similar to the type um, from uh, Luristan, uh, same, same uh, period. So there were plenty of things in, in the exhibition that I thought, wow, that's, you know, I guess kind of cool that they have that. Um, and then there were things that puzzled me like this. And the reason he puzzles me is that I would have thought had, had this little head of a worshiper with its wonderful uh, detail, et cetera, um, had this been an authentic provenance piece in any kind of a collection, even a small little museum in Texas, you know, I, I would have run across this at some point. But there were some things in there that seemed sort of too good to be true. And, and I, I remember thinking like, really? How come I haven't seen this before? I, I feel like I should have. Um, but the real sleuthing happened. Um, you know, I, I think I was, I, Aaron, you'll talk about uh, glass cases. I think I was probably still, um, yeah, maybe not really at that point thinking about forgeries, but Aaron, whose expertise involves um, seal impressions, uh, Aaron was the one who really uh, highlighted uh, a serious problem. So Aaron, take over and tell us about what you did and, and what you found. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. So uh, as Professor Anderson described, uh, we started off our visit to the Hoover exhibition by sort of wandering around, taking things in, and I do think that there was a purposeful ambiguity in the material regarding what was intended to be a replica and what was intended to be sort of an authentic object. So right away, we were puzzled by some of these incongruities. 
Uh, and this led me to sort of take a moment to pause in front of a glass case that held ancient seals, including this one here on the screen. Um, the ancient Near East has a vast and diverse history of sealing practices. Seals were a carved stone or gem that were often used as markers of authority or legitimacy. Typically, the seal took the form of either a stamp that could be pressed upon wet clay or a cylinder that could be rolled across wet clay. This clay document was then made legitimate and official. Seals could be utilized by individuals like an elite or even a king, or they could be used to represent a collective authority like in an archival context or a way station for travelers. Despite the rich and complicated history of sealing traditions, imagery, and practices, there was nonetheless <laughs> a suspicious and problematic quality um, of the seals included in the Hoover exhibition. So focusing on this so-called old Babylonian seal here, the first thing I noticed was the date, circa 1920 BC. I wondered how or who decided upon the date. In other words, the date got me thinking about provenance. Provenance, you know, referring to the contextual information about where and when an object was found or its history of ownership by a museum or another public or private institution or a private collector. The specificity of 1920 was puzzling. Was this based upon a fine spot or was this a stylistic attribution? And who made the decision? Who wrote the exhibition label? So going hand in hand with this observation was the problem of periodization. The date and title of the seal placed it at least near the old Babylonian period, typically 1894 to 1595 BC. But the worship scene shown on this seal reminded me of Neo-Babylonian imagery that develops much later in the seventh and sixth centuries BC. So I'll ask for the, the next slide. Here, I show you an example from the Metropolitan Museum of Art of a Neo-Babylonian worship scene carved into Chalcedony, where we see a worshiper kneeling before an altar. Next slide, please. And here we have more seals done in the Neo-Babylonian style. On the left is a seal in the British Museum collection that depicts a worship scene. We see a standing figure facing an altar and you can see both the carved seal and the image it impresses when it is stamped upon a moldable surface. On the right, I show two Neo-Babylonian worship seals reconstructed in line drawings by Professor Mark Garrison. These images were reconstructed based upon seal impressions left on the clay tablets of the Persepolis Fortification Archive, a corpus of tablets that dates to the Achaemenid period. After their discovery at Persepolis in 1933, the majority of these tablets were sent to the Oriental Institute in Chicago for study. A general estimate puts the corpus at some 15 to 18,000 tablets and thousands of impressions of seals occur upon them. The seals survive today then through their impressions on clay tablets. So when the physical seals, as you see here, were rolled or stamped into the clay, their impressed forms were preserved. And I became familiar with this imagery through my work with Professor Garrison at the Persepolis Fortification Archive Project at the University of Chicago. So, next slide, please. Well, let's return to the so-called Old Babylonian Seal. We've seen together some of the issues regarding the date and periodization, but there were additional problems with the carving style, which you can see is done in a sketch-like manner with an inconsistent approach to technique. This unique approach to carving was shared by the other seals located in the exhibition case. At the time, the fact that all the seals seemed to share the same hand was another red flag. Today, we know that in fact, there was some kind of workshop system in place at Sadiq Gallery that oversaw the production of these objects and may have played a role in the consistency of the carving technique across the seals. Finally, given the confusing issues in date and imagery, 
The general size and weightiness of the seal in question was also suspicious. The two seals I showed you before at the Met and the British Museum both measured in the realm of two to three centimeters, while this seal was over two inches, if memory serves. The size is not listed in the exhibition catalog. So these observations allowed me to raise the issue of provenance during the visit, and I discussed some of these unusual qualities. Next slide, please. Later that night, I went to Google and by utilizing a couple key terms like old Babylonian, stamp steel, steatite, 1920, large, I was able to find Sadiq Gallery within a couple minutes. There were many more seals for sale on the site that appeared to be carved in a similar manner and upon similarly sized stones. Additionally, there were so many other things for sale, but Professor Anderson will discuss some of that momentarily. Before moving forward, I wanted to share a couple reflections about my process and a few things that I hope will be useful, especially to other art historians in training. Next slide, please. I was taking a course on fakes and forgeries with Professor Brenda Longfellow at the very time that I was invited to see the Written in Stone exhibition at the Hoover Museum. In the course, we learned how to engage with issues of authenticity, provenance, connoisseurship, the art market, and more. Professor Longfellow highlighted the importance of formal analysis and the act of close looking when paired with contextual knowledge and that it can lead to important discoveries and conversations about art and its role in the construction of both academic and public facing histories. I think that this course empowered me to question the authority of the glass exhibition case and metaphor metaphorically break through the glass vitrine at the Hoover in an act of questioning that so many academics, writers, theorists, artists, and activists have done before me in different settings. So despite the suspicions that the exhibition raised on the whole, I couldn't quite articulate those issues until I spent time engaging in an act of close looking with a single object. By working with that object on the spot, I came away with key terms that helped me draw links between the exhibition in West Branch, Iowa and the gallery in New York City. We go to museums to learn about history, but we must always be aware of the modes and methods that go into the construction of the history that is presented. In this case, I hope that it becomes clear that the skills of connoisseurship that for too long have been associated with an individual person, their reputation, their authority, and their specialized knowledge can become the learned and embedded techniques employed by many for a more egalitarian and transparent mode of accessing the past and understanding history a history that can never exist in a glass case, separated or disengaged from the power dynamics that shape the very questions asked of the past by cultural institutions and individuals today. Finally, I think that the situation at the Hoover highlights and contributes to longstanding and ongoing conversations about the need for all museums, big or small, to place provenance information at the forefront of their priorities, exhibitions, and collecting practices. And with that, I will turn it back to Professor Anderson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful, Aaron. thank you. <clears throat> okay, so let me just remember this was 10.38 p.m. on Monday night. Aaron sent me the link to the Sadiq Gallery and you, well, I think I may have been at the time teaching Celts and Vikings as well. I teach an art history class of, of Celtic and Viking art. And, and every time I see this photo, I, I pause because there's nothing like that beautiful bronze Viking with the wonderful long beard and, and the entire corpus of Viking art that I'm aware of. Um, anyway, so once the uh, Sadiq gallery was on the radar, the question for me was, how bad is this? And the only way to figure that out was going to be to do the deep dive, go through the whole catalog, right, and, and start documenting. 
because the stakes were very high for the Hoover. If it was just a few objects, they could certainly remove them and, you know, okay, um, the show could go on. But if it was past a certain tipping point, and this was, to my mind and their mind, way past any kind of tipping point, you know, there was, you can't continue with the exhibition. So I knew that if I was going to write them a letter and say, you are full of fakes, or even you have some fakes, you know, I had to get the facts straight. And um, I, I want to be very careful with that. So I, and of course, I, you know, just, just days to work with. Um, so I sat down and I had the catalog and I had photos. And one of the nice things about the catalog is that many of the entries for the objects match keywords on the site. And I think this was what you were alluding to as well, Aaron, that helped you find things. So I, and if you go back just for a moment, you can see there's a search function on the website. And I, I, as a word of background, and again, I, I, I don't want to speak too much about how this place operated because it's, it's really you know, beyond my uh, area of expertise, but they had a long history of sending out print catalogs and then transitioned to this website. And then the website kind of upgraded. And I think one of the issues was that inventory control was um, if indeed these are forgeries, as is alleged, uh, having multiples of the same thing up at once is kind of a giveaway, I think. So uh, what you're looking at here is this nice little uh, cute uh, bronze deity, uh, circa 1200 BC, as you see. And then uh, there's my photo of it uh, next to it. And so what I did is I just did what Aaron did, put in some keywords and what I found, right? Um, well, oh, there he is again. Now remember, he's in West Branch in the Hoover right now. So the fact that he's also for sale on the website was confusing. And then I, I kept kind of, you know, what else can I find? Oh, there he is, but he's a different color. There he is again, yeah. And I think in, I, in the letter to Tom, I wrote, you know, this is not how archaeology works. You don't get multiple copies of the same statue in different colors. Um, yeah, and I think I found 11 different versions of, of this fellow. And here you can see that he is um, for sale as well in some combo packs. Different dates sometimes, different prices. And one other thing I didn't mention here, the product number for these. So there it's 39678. Here it's 33019. These are different objects. It's not the same object that's been maybe photographed in different light, whatever. These were different objects marketed different ways. And then as my son noted, there is a <clears throat> quantity button. And we put in for five and we didn't actually buy them, you know, leave that to the uh, federal agents or, or the state, um, the antiquities crafting unit, but we added and processed and it let us add five to the cart. And again, this is not how archaeology works. You don't get to um, buy in bulk uh, with authentic uh, individual objects. Um, <clears throat> so also, there's the note that each artifact is shipped with a certificate of authenticity documentation regarding the culture and history of your artifact. And I have an example of that certificate I can show you in a little bit, but I think at one point I was so convinced that there must have been some fine print somewhere that said, you know, these are actually not authentic antiquities. These are you know, modeled on, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of... They're not replicas because they're not replicas of existing things for the most part. But I, I, I thought for sure they, they, they must have been, you know, uh, there must have been fine print somewhere. But I never found any. And then what I found instead is more and more things, more and more assertions to the contrary that these are the real thing. 
so this was the documentation process here. You can see this appendix that I put together for um, the Hoover as, as part of writing this letter to uh, Tom. And you can see here that I've sorted this catalog of objects into ones I could buy right now on Sadiq Gallery, and, and there was a lot of them. And then there are ones which are probably this the same thing, but I you know I can't tell from the the small photo that they had on the website or something like that, or things that are kind of generic and hard to tell, like Roman nails, right? Um, and then exact duplicates that not there I couldn't find the exact duplicate with the keywords I used, but I found some ones that were pretty close, like Aaron said, ones clearly carved by the same hand. And then there were a few of ones that. I couldn't find a parallel, although the first one there, I've kind of since seen him quite often. Um, but, you know, if these were authentic, so they, they would have been um, well known, or some of them would were variations of something that was maybe an architectural sculpture that was kind of repackaged, resized into a small figurine, something like that. Um, <clears throat> And then there were some acknowledged replicas in the exhibit as well, um, and, and those were clearly stated. But as you can see, of the 125 objects, um, take away the last uh, eight or so, everything else was either really obviously a forgery that could be purchased right now or was pretty likely a forgery. And so I, I, I kind of divided up into these groups. And then um, here's the guy who I said I couldn't find any parallel of him. And then since the press um, has come out in the last month or two, uh, there he is. Uh, yeah, this was on their regular web page and, and the YouTube channel and everything else. So um, again, if he was purchased by uh, Mr. Martin of the Origins Museum Institute, and he should not still be for sale. As far as I understand how ancient art and archaeology work uh, at the gallery there. Um, yeah, there he is uh, again. And one other note that th this was uh, kind of the nail, well, which was the nail in the coffin? I think it was probably about 11 different figurines, but uh, this was not part of the exhibit loaned to the Hoover but I was just scrolling through other things on the website. And uh, this is very obviously a um, kind of a reinterpretation of the famous bust of Nefertiti um, from uh, the Neues Museum in Berlin, who herself, um, the authenticity of, of, of Nefertiti's bust here is called into question. And it's entirely possible this is a forgery of a forgery. I'll sidestep that uh, further, but what I can show you is that there's a lot of busts of Nefertiti for sale as well. And this again is not really how it works in the ancient world. So to me, I think um, the narrative would be that we, there was, there was this beginning phase of, you know, really needing the art historical skills. And then at a certain point, it just was kind of the obvious by trawling through the entirety of the website and seeing things come up over and over again, or seeing, as you see here, there are three different busts uh, of Tutankhamen. And Tutankhamen, as far as I understand, is not for sale. He is, you know, belongs to the Egyptian Museum or, or a few other uh, museums you might have a little bit of Tut, but you don't get to go buy busts of Tut. Um, and yeah, this is the, these are after the raid. And there you can see Nefertiti down here as, as well. <clears throat> um, I did find, and, and there was interesting, there, there were plenty of blog posts about, oh, this place sells fakes, et cetera. But a lot of them were kind of, um, they seemed to be inactive or something like that. So I was able to sort of back end and find a, um, an example of this certificate of authenticity. It seems to have been taken down from the website, but I um, was able to kind of uh, get to it, uh, I think with the Wayback Machine on, online. And um, this is what, what you got, right? And Mr. Sadiq would verify for you what it is and where it came from, and that's what you get. Um, so, 
yeah, the, the, uh, that's uh, how the authentication worked. Okay, now for the last uh, little bit here, um, I wanna keep an eye on time. I wanted to just note a few uh, issues that came up for us. One is that the standards and guidelines of the College Art Association have a whole section on authentications and attributions. And basically, if I sum it up, um, don't get involved in authenticating objects. You're gonna get sued, stay away. <laughs> um, point eight, right? It is recommended that when the art historian encounters an artwork in a museum that he or she believes to be misattributed, his or her opinion could be communicated privately, not publicly to the appropriate curator, where the artwork is not owned or exhibited by a museum, the art and historian should not get involved, right, unless asked for an opinion. Um, and certainly we were not asked for that opinion, but still felt this moral um, and ethical uh, obligation. And I will say also that's in keeping with the codes of ethics of the uh, Archaeological Institute of America um, and uh, a few other organizations that do say, you know, speak up. Uh, inform law enforcement, et cetera. <clears throat> so then, as I say, I wrote this letter to Tom um, Schwartz, the curator at the at the Hoover, and um, <clears throat> I, I don't think we'll we'll go through it, but I did reference. Um, you can see ninety of the one hundred and twenty five objects in the collections are either definite or very likely fakes tied to the gallery, uh, and of the remaining objects, I have serious concerns about. Um, some of these others. Uh, and so that was kind of, it was, it was an incredibly intense, like four days that all of this happened. And then there was some afterwards, like, you know, contacting the FBI and then there were a few press interviews, et cetera. Um, and I think both Aaron and I learned a lot about the need for careful documentation and realizing that when we went to the Hoover, we were putting our professional and uh, you know, reputation out there, but also potentially opening ourselves up to um, you know, legal uh, concerns if, if you know, God forbid we were wrong, right? Or I was wrong. And I, I tried to keep Erin out of these parts of it to uh, protect her from any kind of liability in that regard. But um, it, was, it was certainly a big step. And, and I, uh, I appreciate that they really, they, they did the right thing, I, I think, and, and acted quickly and decisively, as I said. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to just highlight today uh, in this is that you kind of think, I guess, boy, how could this happen? And I am not a specialist on museum law or museum practices. Um, I'm an art historian that you know, usually tries to work with uh, the Middle East, but I wanted to show um, a couple of excerpts from the, this is the um, International Council of Museums, and then I'll show the American Alliance of Museums as well. And for those of you who um, aren't aware, museums are very, very careful about what they acquire. They have to be. There was a uh, 1970 convention, United Nations Convention, on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. And what that meant is that if a museum is going to acquire something, they got to know the paper trail, right, where it comes from, was it legally exported, all of these kind of things. And yeah, the, 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 the big problem is anything before 1970, well, too bad. But so there are plenty of regula uh, co regulations, principles in the uh, Code of Ethics of ICOM, and then here the American Alliance of Museums. Similarly, uh, lots and lots of kind of expectations for how we acquire objects, how we get rid of objects in our museums. But both are very, very vague about anything to do with loans. And I think the idea, and if I'm wrong here, I will welcome a correction, but I think the idea is that when you're loaning an object, as you see here, 
th the things you need to focus on are, are you going to provide appropriate insurance? Are you going to take care of the objects, you know, in your temporary custody, et cetera. And I think that the sense of verifying that the other museum has, you know, correctly uh, done their homework is something that sort of, in my understanding at least, um, is kind of up to public or sort of the trust between the institutions. Um, and certainly when asked, right, uh, as they were as they were setting this up, I believe, and they said, well, you know, do we have provenance? Do we have all of this? And, and uh, the middleman, this Mr. Martin, could say, yes, I have a certificate of authenticity that these are real things, and I have bought them from a dealer who has, uh, you know, certified that they are legally acquired, etc., right? So the Hoover could have and should have probably, you know, dug a little deeper, but this is this kind of interesting problem of, of loans and provenance. And, and this is the last thing I just want to show you is provenance is a mess for anything before 1930, right? Purchased 1886, that's all we know about it, right? Or those bronze finials or standards I showed you before, um, the one from the British Museum, remember, we don't know where he got this thing. It's before 1970, so we can put it on display anyway, we can include it in the collection. And I think that what happened at the Hoover was, uh, well, kind of this loophole, that, uh, as I see it, of loans, or the fact that you know museums generally trust other museums that are loaning them objects, but they're legit, um, was one thing that, that, that this kind of brought out to us. I think the other thing probably was because we had so much material to work with, and because this was a presidential library and museum and you know the national national archives and it wasn't just one wealthy collector getting defrauded out of a fake i think that that kind of put this question on um, of this particular gallery you know kind of drew the attention uh, i think as i titled the talk it was uh, how it kind of exposed this figure um <clears throat> And my guess, and here I'm just hypothesizing, I would guess that the owner of the gallery that was producing the objects never thought they would get packaged together and loaned as an exhibit uh, to, to a museum. Um, and the fact that that happened, I think was, was um, yeah, kind of a, a, what brought the unwanted attention so, so clearly upon the place. Um, okay, Aaron, my final slide here, it says final thoughts, I think. Do you want to uh, share a few final thoughts with us? Sure, uh, I can say one thing that came to mind as as you kind of took us through those slides. Um, and that, that might be to kind of see a parallel between um, what I was kind of describing as the authority of the, the glass ex exhibition case with what maybe the Hoover Museum hoped to see in this traveling exhibition. Um, I think we could talk about um, who gets major, um, who gets to display, house major collections of ancient objects. Uh, and so this, the ability or the idea that the Hoover might be able to have such a show is so um, exciting and important that maybe that sort of a hopefulness <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in seeing what they wanted to see maybe with their exchanges um, with the Origins Institute led to some of, of this. And I think that kind of could open up a larger question about, about um, how, how museums loan objects exactly as you're saying and, and who gets to really display the past and and how and on what terms you know is it only encyclopedic museums it is, is is it only museums who have established collections of antiquity things like that um brings up a lot of interesting questions about power dynamics sure yeah and and the other thought i, I saw morag kersel's name in here and morag works with looting and i mean looting is a real serious 
much more serious problem. And I, I kind of think that forgery, although it is defrauding and, and, and it is misrepresenting the past, um, it's not surprising that, that more energy goes into antiquities trafficking of real antiquities. And, and um, that's, that's probably as it, as it should be. <clears throat> okay, I think that's all we've got, Aaron. Does that feel like all we've got? And then let's let's adjourn and open up for, for questions. Um, again, thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Bjorn and Aaron. Please, everyone, join me in um, a digital round of applause uh, in the reactions button. Uh, thank you all for this wonderful talk. It was really fascinating. Yes, we do have time for questions. If anyone um, would like to put them in chat, you can do so, or you can raise your digital hand. That is another reaction. It's a raise hand button. Um, and I can call on you and unmute you. So either option is fine with me. We did have some questions in chat that came up and then got answered, I think, for the most part. Oh, um, I, I am sorry. I cannot look at that many things at once. It's I just, okay. I can I can teach a class <laughs> or give a lecture and read chat. It's, it's just not, yeah. No, and, no, that's what I'm here for. Um, I'm asked. Yeah, I, I could respond to a couple of these. Yeah, the, the, how long was the site up? It was up a long time. And yeah, you can find ads in Smithsonian and older copies of the Archaeology Magazine and uh, Biblical Archaeology Review, although they stopped advertising people that sold antiquities about a decade ago, I think. Um, Smithsonian and National Geographic still might. And I think you had answered the question about the due diligence for borrowing materials. Um, and really appreciate that like attention to that kind of loophole in a way. Uh, Valerie Thibodeau asks, yeah. uh, was there ever anything discovered about the Origins Institute? Um, so what I can tell you is that certainly um, we, we looked into this, but I also made kind of a decision like, this is not what I should, I, I'm not going to play cop here this should be left to law enforcement or the press. And I did share some of the you know, stuff that I had kind of come across online about the uh, or origins of for example, with, um, I, I shared that information with uh, law enforcement. Um, and I think that, that there was a, a reporter that was kind of looking into it too. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I can say, I think, uh, that that piece of the story needs to be unpacked a little bit more. Um, but without really knowing too much about it, I, I would hesitate to speculate. Um, however, if you go on the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine, right, you can find some different things uh, there that uh, of that website uh, when it still existed and, and um, could be interesting. Yeah, definitely. There's lots of questions in chat going on. Yeah, um, well, I'll mention one other thing that it, I, yeah. I would be fascinated to find out if the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has the receipts from what he purchased these things for. I think that'd be very interesting one way or the other. You know, was this somebody that bought them full price? Was this, a, you know, uh, how did that work? I don't know. I'm interested, but I don't know the answer. Yeah, I definitely appreciate you giving like your perspective on things being like, this is our timeline on things. So that was really fascinating to see all of this unfold. Um, let me see here. Uh, Mark, I would say, Mark, they didn't, uh, let me, let me um, correct that perspective. If I can, Mark asked, uh, it seems that Hoover only asked our thoughts on the objects a few days before the scheduled opening. Um, Actually, I, I would say that what they did was they allowed us unusual access a few days before the scheduled opening. I, I, I received word from the curator that the objects had arrived. And I said, do you mind if we come over and check them out? And while you're uncrating them and putting them in the cases, can we take photos for our lectures? And they said, sure, come on over. And so the, the, the really quick turnaround there was basically once Aaron kind of made her realization and then I'd go through this whole catalog dig and, and then send an info. So 
I don't think they ever asked us <laughs> for our involvement. It was more we asked them and then we told them. Um, so um, I don't think they were aware that they that these were problematic objects, especially again because it was within the mission. I think of the Hoover to talk about kind of an area related to Hoover's travels and things like that, but they're not experts on the ancient Near East uh, or Egypt. Yeah. Do you want to hit up the other ones in chat, Bjorn? Yeah, Bjorn? I'm just glancing at them. A decision of what to do with the forgeries of the Hoover, again, this um, I, I, I would prefer to leave to a curator, but I believe that um, it had to do with that the museum didn't actually pay for the exhibit, it was the foundation. And I think they explored legal options with the guy who loaned them to them, but ultimately um, I think, I, I, I think they went back to him eventually. They didn't wanna uh, keep them and the, and the FBI uh, didn't seem to want them either. It sounds like they had plenty of evidence for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, did any of the private collectors who brought the forgeries find out about this case or their items are fake? I'm sure, but that's speculating. So sure is probably not the right word. I imagine uh, that lots of people, you know, this was a big story in the New York Times and, and uh, kind of a sensational one. So I, I imagine there's plenty of people saying, hey, what about my uh, stuff? Uh, yeah. And Tanya, uh, let's see, China crosses the Tragman dozen of counterfeits, uh, dozens of legitimate museums still display counterfeits. Um, <laughs> do I want to touch that one or not? Uh, I guess I would say that, um, and Aaron, feel free to speak up, but, uh, or, or Professor Longfellow, if you're here or, or anyone else that wants to, but um, probably most museums have inauthentic artifacts in them. And this is probably why the College Art Association says, don't get involved. Um, it, deciding if something is authentic is tricky and we were lucky because this was so obvious in our eyes that you know selling multiple copies of things at once um so yeah how do you get museums to take a hard look at what they have i mean it does happen but um julie herbie know. in a chat says maybe contacting the registrars privately yeah at the museum Aaron, did you want to add anything on that? Um, I could add at, uh, a little bit, which is just that I know a lot of museums have like teaching collections, um, collections for students to engage with. And so uh, yeah, this is something that I would really add in input on in a really like really case to case <laughs> basis if you're going to start commenting on any institution's collections as as professor anderson was nicely saying yeah you really want to be um sure and careful um and go forward uh, in a manner that's as positive i think as possible and and i do think um uh the idea that some of these objects that we're talking about generically could become part of a teaching collection so that students can really work closely with them. You can talk through some of these issues uh, because there's still interesting modes of accessing uh, the way we think about things and the construction of history and in this setting, you know, it, of the past. So um, I think there are more learning moments that could be accessed um, with, with some of these objects maybe. Yeah, and Maura, great, great question there about, you know, why not just put them on display and say, hey, these are fakes. Um, that was something they thought about, I will say. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the conversation, I think, at first was, you know, kind of how can we say this? And uh, I did a little bit of, um, I wouldn't say, well, maybe consulting with the director. Of, you know, he just asked, like, what do we do now kind of questions. Um, I mean, I don't want to say that. He was indecisive, but you know, he, we, we, he bounced a few things off me. When was can we call these replicas? And say, you know, this is an exhibit of replicas, and, and they weren't replicas. They're, they are not 
for the most part, replicas of authentic things. They're kind of made to look as though they're authentic things, but you know, they're resizing or, 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 or you know, changing the authentic things. So a replica would be um, you know, a cast, a real object. And I think as far as the didactic moment of market institutions, they could have done that, I believe, and I am speaking here doing what I'm not supposed to do is speculating. I, I think it was kind of an issue of, this is an embarrassment for us, unfortunately. And I think just having it go away was probably what they wanted to do rather than kind of, I mean, then almost have to say, hey, we got defrauded, everybody, check it out, you know, come see the fakes. Uh, I think that's probably why more ag, um, but yeah, they could have done that. I think that would have been, been interesting to do. And actually along those lines, uh, Marisa Rudy has a question. Do you believe the Hoover Museum could have benefited from having a resident art historian? Could the situation have been avoided with better training for museum staff? Um, um, so on the one hand, sure. On the other hand, it's a small museum and they're, you know, with a small staff and um, mainly what they work with or almost entirely is, is the possessions owned by Hoover and documenting those and, and putting them up. So I think it's kind of a, a matter of, of scale. Um, and if they had a full-time art historian, it probably wouldn't be somebody who had an expertise in antiquity. It would be somebody who had an expertise in, you know, Herbert Hoover's day and age and, and things from, from his period. So um, I'd love for everybody to have an art historian at home and, and at work and, you know, have one in the car you can talk to when you drive. But uh, I don't know that it would make a lot of sense for the Hoover to have somebody at least who could authenticate antiquities. Um, and I appreciate that they reached out to us uh, and, and got us involved, yeah. Uh, all right, how do you guys feel about maybe one more or call it a day? Let's see, um, there, yeah, there are a lot of- There the, are a lot. Let me just we can I, get I to read for a moment, um, unless you wanna take a stab at one, Aaron. I mean, it's Zoom so people can leave whenever they want, right? But- um, So Katina's question, yeah. uh, can you discuss a bit the relationship between looting and the sales of inauthentic objects and fake uh, in looting its local communities that are harmed, um, as well as archaeological understanding of their context? So with the sale of inauthentic objects, the buyer is harmed and scammed. Um, but I'm curious if the sale of inauthentic objects uh, contributes to looting. What do you think? And Morag has written in the chat, and Morag is, is somebody I would defer to on this question. So Morag, if you can be unmuted and want to, want to chime in, uh, please do. Um, is that a possibility, Deb? It is a possibility. Uh, you yeah, don't have yeah. to, Morag, but if you want to, um, it's, it's, yeah. The, well, I, thanks, Bjorn. I mean, I don't want to take over or co-opt or anything, but I just want people to understand, like, fakes and looted objects for sure that gallery had legitimate material not everything they had was fake right so this is how it works is that there are some real materials in that gallery so they get a good reputation and then they start introducing fakes and so it's all part of the same system and it all leads to looting at the site because you also have to have legitimate available legitimate uh, material but ultimately, it's all uh, driven by institutional and um, individual demand and people not asking the right questions, which is what a lot of people in the chat have been asking, like, how could a museum be duped like this? Museums are duped like this every day and big museums like the Met and not just like smaller institutions, but all kinds of individuals and institutions are duped all the time. Thank you, Morag. And, and it's, it's such an honor to be able to call on, you know, the world's expert on the topic uh, to answer the question for me. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I'm honored that you were here to, to listen to this. This is fabulous um, on many levels. So 
thank you all for this. And really, yeah, just a fascinating and saddening story um, about all of this. Um, I hope our students that are present here uh, understand the ramifications both of looting and, um, and forgeries. Um, and with that, if it is okay. Actually, Deb, can I just yeah. really quick, I see Sadie put something in there about how can we have any trust in museums if this kind of stuff occurs? I don't know, that just seems like a, a sad note to end on. Um, I, I hope that, you know, things are getting better. And I, and I think that um, the curators that I know are, you know, really good people working hard to try and do the right thing. It's, it's, it's complicated for a number of reasons, but um, I think, I hope you can still go to museums and, and feel like, hey, this is great stuff. And I believe it, um, even if there are some things there that, you know, you might, uh, that might not be authentic. Hopefully most things are, um, but yeah, I, I, I hate for us to leave here thinking that we can't trust anything in a museum anymore. Right, and I should say too, I guess as, um... As a graduate student who's not yet maybe an official professor or official this or that, I think as students especially, um, this should be a case study that that says you know you can be an active spectator at at a museum. You don't have to passively consume the exhibition labels or the objects you're seeing. You know, respond, react, write to individuals who work at the museum. You know, talk to your friends. Um, it's a space to discourse and engage and challenge. And so I hope that's also something you can take from this, this talk tonight. Well, yeah. thanks, thanks to you guys for giving us a forum to share the story. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one, I think. Yeah, well said to both of you. Um, thank you for this. And if you do want to uh, spend my, throw money wisely, here is the link for the AIA membership. Um, which is one of the sites that uh, Dr. Anderson showed in his presentation as a place that verified, you know, the actions that he should take. Um, and so thank you for that, um, Bjorn. Thank you for this talk, Aaron and Bjorn. This was just a fabulous talk. Everyone in chat is additionally um, sending their praises. So um, before I let you all go, I would like to plug another very wonderful talk that we have coming up. Um, it is on November 15th at 5.30 p.m. Dr. Rachel Myers at, the, uh, at Iowa State University will be um, talking about female benefactors in the Roman Empire. And if you'd like to register for that, that link is here in chat as well. Um, this will probably go up, this recording will probably go up on YouTube in the coming days. Um, and so I hope you all can, again, thank um, Bjorn and Aaron for this wonderful talk. Again, thank you all for, uh, for being here and presenting this fascinating information. Thank you all. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks all. Cheers. Thank you so much.